today's Torah portion, Chumash portion, for the portion of Noach, the Wednesday or fourth portion, chapter 8, verse 15. Vaidaber Elohim el Noach Lemor. And God spoke to Noach, saying, Yesterday's portion we concluded, explaining, giving the timeline that they spent a year, a complete solar year in the ark. <clears throat> and now God speaks to Noah, saying, this is the post-flood world. Say min ha-teva, go out of the ark. <clears throat> and God has to command them to go out of the ark. Simply speaking, they were afraid to go out of the ark. Ata, you, God speaking to Noach, you, v'ishtecha, and your wife, uvanecha, and your sons, uneshevanecha, and your sons' wives, itach, with you. Rashi, ata, v'ishtecha, in the ark we learned intimacy was forbidden, relations was forbidden, both for men, <clears throat> both for humans, as well as for animals. Now that they're being commanded to emerge from the ark, unlike the order in the verse earlier, where it said you, your sons, your wife, their wives, here it says you, your wife, your sons, their wives. Ish ishte, man and wife. Khan here, he tirlohem, he once again permitted them to engage in tashmishamita, in intimacy. In fact, not only <clears throat> did he permit them to, but as we will learn in the next verse, he commanded them to. The number one mitzvah post-flood was be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. 17, in addition to emerging on your own, you and your wife, your sons and their wives, also, take out of the ark, kol hachaya, all the animals, asher itcha, which are, which have been in the ark with you. We call basar of all flesh, <coughs> ba'ayf, whether they are of the bird, the fowl family, uva behema, or <coughs> the animals, <coughs> excuse me, uva kol haremes, and anything that creeps or swarms, haremes alo oretz, which swarms upon the earth, Haitze, this is an interesting word. It's a Creek sieve. It's written with a vav, but it's read with a yud. Haitze itach, bring out with you the shortsu vaoretz, and may they swarm the earth, ufru or foru verovu al haoretz. Let them be fruitful and let them multiply on earth as well. Rashi, haitze, hotze sieve. The written word would be read. Hotze, but it's not read that way. Haitze kri, it's read haitze. Haitze emer lohem sheyetsu. Command them to go out. Hotze imenem reitzim lotze tzitziyamata. If they don't want to go out, force them to go out. And in his talks on this portion, the Rebbe asks a question. He says, why would the animals be hesitant to go out? Animals have been entrapped in an ark for a year. They would be dying to get out. And the Rebbe explained a very interesting teaching based upon the teachings of Kabbalah, also alluded to in various medroshim. And that is that the existence of the entire, of all the inhabitants of the ark during that year was a supernatural existence. Just as it says when Mashiach will come, Vigor ze'ev im keves, that the wolf and the lamb will live together. So also, in the ark, there was the miracle. The animals did not attack each other. The animals lived in a world which had a taste of Mashiach. And therefore, the nature of the animals was transformed to a Mashiach dika world, a messianic world. The animals were very happy animals and they didn't attack and they were not vicious. 
suddenly coming out of the ark, they would have to return to their earlier natural existence. They were hesitant. Why leave a messianic world? Therefore, says God to Noah, the party's over, the year is over, it's time to go back to the natural world. They tell an adorable story, one of my favorite stories, that they created a museum in Israel. It was the museum of messianic days to show how the world will be when Mashiach comes. And one of the exhibits, one of the more famous exhibits, is they had the, uh, the wolf or the lion with the lamb. They had in one cage the lion and the lamb. And somebody came and says, this is the most fantastic thing in the world. Tell me, Mashiach isn't here yet. How do you do it? He says, it's very simple. Every day we get a new lamb. <laughs> it's not a problem. <laughs> so that's the temporary messianic world. Every day you need a new lamb. The Shortsuba Oretz, let them swarm over the earth, but not in the ark. Magid, from here we learn again, that even animals, even birds, were forbidden, were forbidden to cohabitate, to live together, to be intimate in the ark. Only coming out of the ark were they permitted to. And again, in one of the Rebbe's talks, the Rebbe pointed out, as we'll see again and again, well, I'll, I'll wait until chapter 9. By even Noach, Mizbeach Lashem, Noach built an altar for God. By Ikach, and he took Mikhail HaBehemah HaTeda from all of the pure animals, meaning kosher, because we learned earlier that of the pure or kosher animals, he took seven male, seven female. Umikhail Eif HaTor, of the kosher birds, he took seven male, seven female. He took of those birds by Yal, and he offered a lace. Offerings by Mizbeach on the altar. There's a... All right, let's look at Rashi. Mikhail HaBehem HaTeda, Omar, he said to himself, The reason God told me to bring seven and seven and not one and one, is to bring offerings, therefore it must be the right thing. And this offering is what allowed the world to continue once again. These were the famous offerings of Noah. There's a medrash that I saw. The medrash actually explains the number seven and seven. That how many people were there in the ark? There were eight. There was Noah and his wife, that's one couple. Shem, Chom, and Yophis, and their wives, there's three couples. Three plus one is four, four couples, eight people. The animals, there were seven and seven. Seven sets. Noah saw that he had seven male animals and seven female animals of the kosher species. Everyone wanted to bring an offering, with the exception of Chom and his wife. They said, we're not into God, we're not into offerings, leave us alone. We're out of here. So they needed six, because they lost two. Eight minus two is six. So they took of the six animals of the seven, and they brought an offering for each of the people. The seventh one, the seventh male and female, were left for reproduction. So that's the number of seven and seven. Six and six were brought as offerings. One and one was left for reproduction, corresponding to the six and six of the people who wanted to have the sacrifices. Noah and his wife, Shem, Yophas, and their wives. That's a medrash, which is an interesting perspective on how, of, how this works. And of course, we know that there are many, many medroshim. This is a perspective. Okay. 21. And God smelled the sweet savor. Or, as Rashi explains in other places, God saw the tremendous nachas from seeing goodwill. And Hashem said to himself, No longer will I curse the earth. Because of man, I'm going to accept man for what he is. Ki yetzer leiv ha'odam, because the imagination or the inclination of the heart of man 
Ra minu Urov is evil from his very youth. And therefore, it is what it is. No longer will I smite every living thing that I made. A flood was a one-time phenomenon. Never again, God says, will I ever bring a flood to the world. And there's a lot to be said here because the flood cleansed creation. It was like a mikvah for the world. The people of the post-flood era were different people. They were tamed. They entered into a new world. Nevertheless, there is an oath and a commitment which Hashem makes that the flood is never again. Mina Urov, Mina Orov Ksiv, it says from his youth, Mishanina Lotis Mime Ima Initan Bayetsahara, that the evil inclination enters man from the moment of birth. And this is why the Yetzer Hara, the evil inclination, is referred to by our sages as Melech Zaken Uksil, the old foolish king. The evil inclination is the old foolish king. The Yetzer Tov, the good inclination, is younger. Why is it younger? Because the good inclination doesn't fully enter man until his bar mitzvah. So the evil inclination is 13 years older. That's why it's Melech Zaken Uksil. This is repeated in the terms of an oath. God says, I took an oath never to cross, never to bring about the waters of Noah. This is the expression of oath. When there's a repetition, it's a form of oath. And so our sages interpret it. Now, <clears throat> There's an interesting point here, and that is that when God decided to bring the flood, he used a similar expression. If you want to look at chapter 6, verse 5, Chapter 6, verse 5, in the book we use here, page 54, it says, Vayar Hashem ki rabba roas ha'odam ba'oretz. God saw that the wickedness of man was abundant. Vechol yetzer mach shuves and the imagination of his heart, rak ra kol is all evil. So God says, because man is evil, I'm bringing a flood. What does it say in this verse? It says in, 20, in verse 21, chapter 8, God said, I never again will bring a flood. Because man is evil. And the Rebbe talks about this. The same reason for bringing a flood is the same reason for never again bringing a flood. What's going on here? It's the same reason. I'm going to bring a flood because man is evil. I'm never again going to bring a flood because man is evil. And from here we learn that there was a change in the system of the world, as we're about to learn in the next verses. Man was always created with good and evil. God acknowledges that man has good and evil. And from now on, it is the job of man to choose good over evil. And that choice will result in reward and punishment. But I will no longer destroy the world as I did during the flood because... This is the nature of man. So it's not that the nature of man has changed, it's that God's decision has come to a change. There's a lot more to be said, but not in the setting of this class. And here we come into the details of the oath, 22, that God swore never again to bring a flood. By the way, as we will learn, the sign for that is the rainbow. We see a rainbow Sometimes when it rains and the sun hits the clouds in a certain direction and so on and so forth, the message of the rainbow is the reason God instilled, invested within nature a system of the creation of a rainbow when certain conditions come about is even though it's raining or even though it just rained, I don't want you to worry. There will never again be a flood. Therefore, it says that when we see a rainbow... 
our tendency is to celebrate. Yay, there's a rainbow. Perhaps the tendency should be just the opposite. God is saying, if not for my promise, maybe I should. Uh, so that the rainbow means, hey guys, watch out. Be careful. Anyway, going to the details of the oath. Eid kol yimei aretz, as long as the world will be here. Zera, and here he goes on to enumerate six seasons. The 12 months of the world can either be divided into four seasons. If you divide 12 months into four seasons, it's three months to every season. And that's when we talk about winter, spring, summer, and fall. It's four seasons, three months each. Or 12 months can be divided into six seasons. Then you have two months per season. That's what this verse does. Zera, the kotzir, the ker, the chaim, the kayetz, the chayetz. These are the six seasons. Sea time and harvest time. Cold and heat, summer and winter. The yeim v'layla on top of that, day and night. Because during the flood, day appeared to be like night and night appeared to be like day. Lo yishbesu, never again will that be disturbed. It will always follow the system. Eid kol yimei ha'oretz begeim v'lo yishbesu vav yitimalalu. These six seasons, shnei chadashim l'chol echad v'echad, two months each. Kameshoninu, as we learn, chatsi kishle yomar cheshven v'chatsi kislev zera. Half of Tishrei, the second half of Tishrei, the month of Cheshvan, and the first half of Kislev is seed time. Chatsi, Kislev, Tevis, Vachatsi, Shvat. The second half of Kislev, all of Tevis and half of Shvat, is Chayda, Fiskeir. The Chulu, as he goes on to describe it in Talmud, Baba Metziah 106. Keir, cold is even Koshim, Chayda, is more severe than the winter. Keir is the dead of winter. Chayda, Ezer, Asayda, Bekitis, that's when we plant barley and beans. Hecharif and this Vashamar, which ripen quickly. Ker hu chatsi shvat va adar v'chatsi nisan. Ker is half of shvat, adar and half of nisan. Kotzir, chatsi nisan v'ir v'chatsi sivan is half of nisan. Ir and half of sivan. Kayitz, chatsi sivan, tamas v'chatsi of, half of sivan. All of tamas and half of of. Was man l'kitas tenim, that's when they gather the figs. Was man shem v'ayish nisan v'asodis, and they dry them in the field. Was my kayitz, it's called kayitz. Kamei v'alechem v'kayitz l'echol anoyim. Chaim is the seif yom esacham at the end of the summer. And we in California can appreciate the fact that the end of the summer is hotter than the summer. We, 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 we have that. I think they call it an Indian summer. Uh, because, you know, when I grew up in, in, in back east, it was the dead of the summer was hotter. And you come into September, it's cool already. And Sukkot, Sukkot September, October, it's cold. And it's raining and it's freezing. But uh, the California climate and uh, possibly the Israeli climate as well is that the end of the summer gets hotter, and this is what Rashi is saying. Chatsi of el, the chatsi tishrei, half of of, all of el, and half of tishrei. Sha'elam cham b'yeseh, where it gets very hot. Kameshinim sechaz yeme, shili kaita, the end of summer. Koshim kaita is hotter than the summer. Certainly we have that here. V'yeim belayel le yish b'yeseh, miklal sheshov. So from here we learn that they had ceased kol yimei samabal all the days of the flood. It's because the planets did not function in a regular system. It was not recognizable. The difference between day and night. All these shall not stop functioning as usual. Chapter 9. God bless Noach and his children. And he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. And replenish the earth. This is... The first mitzvah post-flood is be fruitful and multiply. The first mitzvah God gave to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. Having children, bringing children into the world is the first possible mitzvah. The Rebbe pointed out in his talks that we see here that the first mitzvah of the post-flood era was bringing children into this world, a lot of children. And the Rebbe said that our generation experienced its own flood of sorts, and that's the flood of the Holocaust, where six million Jews perished. No matter how many Jews we bring into this world, it's not going to easily replenish the six million we lost. Because imagine had we not lost six million, what the Jewish population <clears throat> would be today, because we lost a third of our people, and therefore it is incumbent upon our generation 
survivors and children of survivors and grandchildren of survivors, and we are all survivors no matter where our parents were at the time, to bring large families to establish families to bring a lot of children into the world because we have a lot of lost people to replace and Jews above all should be fruitful and multiply. By the way, this mitzvah is for all human beings. <clears throat> all human beings should be fruitful and multiply. I heard something in, 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 on the lighter side perhaps. In, in the, in, it's very cute is that no matter what your beliefs are in life, no matter what your philosophy is, if you want to continue that philosophy, you want to perpetuate that philosophy, you better bring children into this world and raise them with that philosophy. Otherwise, your beliefs will be reduced by the beliefs of the people around you who will bring children into this world and teach them and bring them up with their beliefs. Even if your philosophy is you live and die with the theory of ZPG, zero population growth, even if your philosophy is this world has too many people, you better have a lot of children and teach them that philosophy so that they can teach that the world has too many people. Otherwise, you're not going to have any children and everybody else will. And before you know it, you're going to be overwhelmed with other beliefs. And we... I don't want to get into a lecture on demographics, but we take a look at the demographics of the world today and we see how it is rapidly changing, and uh, that's all I'm going to say right now. Okay, let's get back to the Chumash. Verse 2. And your fear and your dread shall be upon the beasts of the earth, this is an interesting phenomenon which God invested in nature, is that no matter how big an animal is, an animal fears a human being. The and upon all the fowl of the air, the wherever the ground swarms, will behold the gayam and the fish of the sea. But yet you, the human being, are the master of creation. The norm is that man rides on the elephant. Elephants don't ride on men, hopefully. Or that man is having a very bad day. Terror. terror. There's the famous verse by Yehi. The fear of God was on the cities with Yaakov after the whole story with Shimon Alevi. The word chitas means fear. Sense of life. As long as a baby is living in Atatzorich. But mice won't bother a baby because mice are afraid of living things. But you can have a giant as big as old king of Bashan who will die. You have to watch him from mice and vermin because dead doesn't scare animals. When will your fear be upon the animals? As long as you are alive. Verse 3, every moving thing that lives, shall be for you as food. Like the green herbs I have given you all. This is a pivotal Rashi, where Rashi reveals something very interesting from the Gemara Sanhedrin. God says, I did not permit the first man, Adam, to eat meat. Adam and Eve were vegetarians. It wasn't until Noah, post-flood, that men were permitted to eat meat. Therefore, when we talk about the seven Noahide laws, Seven laws which God gave Noah, which is the st section that we're studying right now. We're learning about the laws that God gave Noah. We talk about the seven laws that Hashem gave Noah. How many did he give Adam? Before Noah, there were only six laws. Why? Because the law of not tearing a limb, ever minachai, not tearing a limb off an animal and eating it, but killing the animal first, or in liberal terms, 
cruelty to animals, not to be cruel to animals. That was a law that was given only to Noah because Adam had no right to eat meat, so the law was out of place. That's what Rashi says. So I've given you permission to eat meat. This was the first time that mankind was permitted to eat meat. Now we're learning about the whole seven Noahide laws. One of them is that you may eat meat, but you may not be cruel to the animal. Ach basar However, flesh which still has its life, you may not eat. Bosa benafshe osar lahem, he prohibited for them aver minachai, a limb from a living animal. Klaimah, this means to say, calls man shenafshe, but as long as its life is still there, leiseich la bosa, you may not eat the meat. Later, post Mount Sinai, the Jewish people were given the kosher laws. You have to slaughter the animal. Noah and his family were not given kosher laws. They had to kill the animal. They're not allowed to eat it while it's living. And this is Eva Minachai, which again in loose terms is the mitzvah of not being cruel to animals. While it still lives. This is the famous Noahide prohibition of not eating any limb from a living animal. Also with the life, you can't eat blood from a living animal. The non-Jew may eat blood only when the animal is killed first. Another one of the Noahide laws, five and surely your blood from your own lives, Edrish, I will demand, Miyad Kol Chaya Edrisheno, from every living being, I will demand it. O Miyad Odom, and from the hand of man, Miyad Ish Achiv, the hand of every man and his brother, Edrish, I will demand this, Nepesha Odom, the life of man. This is murder. Murder is forbidden. Another one of the Noahide laws. Even though I permitted you to take a life of an animal to eat, but if someone takes even his own life, suicide, suicide is a sin, and God will punish in the afterworld for suicide. Suicide is a terrible sin. Even if somebody chokes or hangs himself where there's no blood, still it violates the Noahide laws which speak of blood. Even though blood doesn't come forth. Because the generation of the flood sinned. And in the generation of just preceding the flood, Animals would randomly attack people. The fear of people was removed from animals. People were likened to animals. Here, the Torah is compelled to warn the animals, saying, now post-flood, there's a new world. You have to respect human beings. This commandment is to the animals. So God says, if there are witnesses, then we hope that the courts will prosecute. Because one of the seven Noahide laws, the only positive one, is to set up courts of justice. So the courts will prosecute a murderer. What if there are no witnesses? What if somebody murdered without witnesses? On the edge, God says, I have my ways. I'll find a way to kill the guy. Or from the hands of someone who loves the other person like a brother and accidentally killed him. This is what we call manslaughter. It was an accident. On the Edrish, I will also require punishment of sorts. What kind of punishment? Later, we learn about the whole idea of the city of refuge, which is atonement for manslaughter. In Le Yigla, if he will not go into exile, even before that mitzvah, some form of exile, and seek for his sin to be forbid, for, forgiven. We see that with the story of Cain and Abel, Cain went into exile. Even when somebody inadvertently, accidentally takes the life of a man, he also needs atonement. 
And if there are no witnesses to make him go to the city of refuge, he's not humbled before Hashem. God will figure out a way to do that. As our rabbis interpret in the famous tractate of Machus, that God will find a way to arrange that the murderer will be murdered and the manslayer will have to go into exile. And that is by having the murderer standing under the ladder, the manslayer climbing up the ladder, falling on him, so the murderer is killed, and the manslayer who publicly fell upon a guy again is going to have to go to the city of refuge. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Mizamnon Lepundag Echad, God arranges that they come to one hotel, and that is worked out. The Baal Shem Tev has a talk, a, a, a teaching on this, that sometimes it carries over from one lifetime to another. There's the idea of Gilgul Nishamas, of reincarnation, that our souls are reincarnated again and again and again into different bodies. Sometimes what happens in this lifetime is not understood because it's making amends for something that happened in a previous lifetime. And that's a whole teaching of Kabbalah having to do with Gilgul and so on. Six, Rashi, and we didn't do Chumash yet. Chumash six, Sheifech dam ha'odam ba'odam, one who sheds the blood of man within man, dam ma'yishapech, his blood shall be shed. And here, the Torah legislates death penalty. Death penalty for murder. Kibitzel ha'melekim also as ha'odam, because in the image of God, he made man. Ba'odam dam ma'yishapech, im yesh edim, only if there are Credible witnesses, and the witnesses have to be interrogated. There's a whole section in the Tractate Sanhedrin which speaks about witnesses and interrogating witnesses and the systems of witnesses and the credibility of witnesses. Hamisu Atam, you must put him to death. Lama, why? It's not just a man that he killed, he killed a man created in the image of God. Also, I saw Adam's Amikrakotsu. This is one of those short verses. Sarachlias. But it also means to say, the Creator created man. Closing verse, be atem and yal, pru be fruitful and multiply. Shirtsu ba'aret, swarm the earth, or revuba and multiply therein. Be atem, pru revu, the pipshute, according to its simple meaning. Harishena lebracha. Earlier there was a blessing, the kan and here it's a command. Or the fi medrashi, the medrash says, the hakish to compare Misha in Asik one who does not engage in bringing children into this world. Everybody has to marry and try to bring children into this world. The Shafir Domim, it's a sense of shedding blood because one is withholding the children he could have brought into this world from coming into this world. End of today's Chumash portion.